Let me very quickly situate the lecture this morning within the larger context of, uh, of the course, Sociology 10. Uh, you will recall that uh, the subject matter of the course covers three basic concepts, self, nation, and citizenship. <clears throat> self, basically, we are dealing here with the process by which we as human beings, individual human beings, differentiate ourselves from others, particularly from our families. Um, we discover through language that we are being separate from, from the families that nurtured us. We are separate beings from our peers, our classmates, although certain fundamental similarities may bring us together. We discover our need for autonomy, particularly when you come to the university, a school like the University of the Philippines, you begin to assert not only your individuality, but your need for autonomy or freedom. Uh, you may have come in the first instance to the university with a course chosen not by you, but by your parents. But subsequently, probably in the middle of the first semester, you decide that you did not want to be a lawyer or a doctor or a business person, but wanted to choose your own life. That should be the case. There is the struggle for autonomy. Subsequently, we discover that beyond autonomy and freedom, we wanted to ask ourselves what we should do with this freedom or the autonomy that we desire. There are two basic models for, for a human being like yourselves. First is the model of maybe Jesus Christ, to form ourselves as a man or a woman for others, but particularly if you came from the school just across Katipunan, <laughs> to be a man for others. In other words, to, to form ourselves into a person who can be of distinct service to other people. But this course hopefully will have taught you that there is another goal that is worth pursuing. And that is the goal of self-perfection. Meaning before you can be of service to others, you have to be of service to yourself. That is to say, to form and to carve yourself into a work of art. So that living then essentially becomes synonymous with writing a poem. The poem being your life. Life as literature. But I will not delve uh, on that subject. Later on, I don't know, every instructor is given the opportunity to decide whether to begin with nation or to begin with self. I assume that many of you began with self. Subsequently, you find yourself tackling the whole nation, the whole concept of nationhood, or belongingness to an imagined community. Particularly for us Filipinos, because we were emerging from more than three centuries of colonial servitude, during which time we did not have much of a chance to discover our being as a separate nation. And in fact, indeed, our nation was born in the course of this struggle to become an independent nation free from colonial servitude. So we imagined ourselves as one people bound by a common history and bound by, by common aspirations. Uh, we have figured out for ourselves what it means to be a Filipino. A Filipino is somebody who eats balut. So, a uh, Filipino is somebody who can manage the Filipino language. So something like a Filipino is somebody who knows the values of the society in which we live as embodied or personified by the people we call heroes. But national identity or the nation as a source of our identities has been very much interrogated in the context of a globalized world. If you have more than 10% of the Filipino population living abroad, and Filipino children being born and growing up in, in cultures, guest cultures, uh, as guests 
in cultures that are not their own, then you must question what would be the fundamental elements of a Filipino identity. And indeed, that section of the course will have led you to what it means to be a modern Filipino in a globalized, digitalized, and postmodern world. Today's lecture deals with the third aspect. And this particular reflections that I wanted to share with you precisely give me an opportunity to think of certain items that we may have left out in the course of writing the book, but which have been the subject of recent columns in my Philippine Daily Inquirer column, Public Lives. This has to do with citizenship. To my mind, if you ask me, this is the most crucial, the most important part of the course. What is a citizen? Well, you all know what a netizen is. No. A netizen is somebody who inhabits the internet. Uh, a netizen is somebody who lives most of his or her life in the internet. No. I am as, I'm certain that many of you are netizens. What is a citizen? I looked up the original meaning of the word. It really meant inhabitant of the city or the city. But the city is not like just like Metro Manila, a place. You know? The city is a stable community. The city is some, some place you come home to after you return from the wars, for example. The city is where you feel confident about leaving your family and your children, and, and during that time, even your slaves, you know, and not feel that in, 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 leaving, in leaving them behind in the city that they would be in any danger. A city, therefore, is a stable and peaceful place that, that citizens claim for themselves, that they, have, that they have built and carved for themselves. The Greek word for city was polis meaning the city-state, the most famous of which was the Athenian city-state, uh, the city-state in which Socrates or Plato or Aristotle uh, during that time may have moved. I emphasize, I prefer to use the word, the Greek word polis or the city-state because of the argument that I'm going to make in the course of this lecture. It is from the word polis that we derive the word politics actually. Uh, the citizen of a polis was a polites, and the activity of those who inhabit the polis is politics. All right. What is politics, therefore? Politics is the vocation, therefore, of a citizen. Politics is what citizens do. The question is, is everybody a member of the polis? How does one become a citizen or a member of the police? There are fundamental requirements. For example, slaves and barbarians were not citizens. They had no rights. They had no freedom. During that time, even women were not citizens, unfortunately. Children were not citizens. In other words, they were not entitled to participate in the public realm of the police. They were confined to the private realm of the household. To be a citizen, to be a member of the Greek polis meant that somebody needed to be free or liberated from life's necessities. You cannot be a member of the polis if you're hungry. If you're, you cannot be a member of the police if you spend most of your life working. You cannot be a member of the police if you are a slave to somebody else. A citizen, therefore, a member of the police, was somebody who was free from the necessities of life. And therefore, he was entitled to enter the Agora. The Agora, we saw, there is an Agora in San Juan, but that is not the, the Agora that we mean. Because the, the term Agora was used to refer to a marketplace. In actual fact, the Agora, during Greek times, was the marketplace of ideas. This was the public realm. This was where people debated with one another, argued with one another, and tried to persuade one another. 
The Agora, therefore, was the place specifically designated for the conversation, the dialogue, the debate among free human beings, among free people. A condition, therefore, for participation in the Agora or the public realm was that you were free. You were a free person. Freedom during that time meant that you were a ruler over your own household. Somebody who could not rule over his own household, like some former politicians that we know, they give birth to so many people and they cannot properly administer their affairs, have no right to enter the Agora and pretend that they could participate in the administration of a larger community like the city state. You know what, who I am probably referring to. Therefore, citizenship meant during that time the capacity for rulership over your own family, over your own household. If you could not rule over your own wife and children and slaves and workers, therefore you were not entitled to participate in politics. What does this mean? It meant basically that politics was the activity of people who could afford free time, leisure. Therefore, they could walk, they could talk, they could converse, they could dialogue with other free men without being afraid that somebody was going to dominate them. Therefore, the agora in which politics took place was the assembly of free and equal human beings. A precondition is that you are free and that nobody rules you outside of your household, that you could converse with people you can regard as your equals. The agora or the public realm in which politics took place was sharply differentiated from the household. In other words, while you bring the concerns of your household into the realm of politics, you cannot expect other people who are participating in the political process to take into account only the necessities of your household. Politics was meant to formulate people's concept of the common good. In other words, the good of every household that constitutes uh, that, that city state. If you were free as a human being, as a citizen, to enter the agora or the public realm, you were equally free to live. In other words, freedom basically meant freedom to participate and freedom to abandon the police. You can leave the police, the city state, and found another city state if you like. Okay, what then, what if, does it mean to be political? The equation is something like this. Citizenship meant freedom, basically freedom from material necessities, equals to be political. Now, this is not to be confused with rulership or government. Nowadays, when we say politics, we mean only government. But that's only a very small aspect of the concept of politics. You know? What free persons do, basically, in the political realm is something like this. They speak with others who are equally free. They compare their views with other people. They try to persuade other people to agree with their own opinions. In other words, they bring their opinions into the political realm, like they expect others to bring their own opinions, but they're also conscious that that's only their opinion. And that is not the full definition of reality. In other words, the political space allows them to compare their opinion with the opinions of others. They try to persuade others, you know, this is how I see things, and therefore this is also the way I expect you to see things. The art of persuasion. The art of persuasion is what we call rhetoric. You know? and, and many times, there are schools for persuading people. The art of rhetoric, you know? in order to arrive at common agreements. Apart from speaking out, however, no? remember that, the basic component of politics is speaking. It's words, actually. That is how important words are, because it is through well-chosen words that we are able to persuade others 
to believe in our own opinions. But apart from that, free people are expected to act on their own opinions, on their own ideas. What do you do when you are able to persuade others to agree with you? You act. You act on your ideas. What does acting mean? Acting basically means, during that time at least, initiating new beginnings. They organize. Whatever it is, maybe a new project, a new program, a new law, perhaps a new constitution. You initiate new beginnings. In other words, politics is nothing if it is perpetually or eternally pegged to old ideas, like maybe a constitution. To be political means to be constantly thinking of new beginnings and new things. That is the basic component of that thing. Now, I have very briefly explained to you what the tra classical tradition of politics entails. What is politics today? Well, as I said, the Greeks invented politics because before the Greeks there was nothing like politics. Remembering that politics is the vocation of free people. The classical meaning of politics, however, has been largely forgotten. Today, it has been equated with rulership or government or the relationship between those who rule and those who are ruled. Today, if you are asked what is a citizen or what do you expect good citizens to do, they will tell you read the Constitution because the Constitution tells you your rights and obligations as citizen. If that were simply the case, then, then you would have no need for politics. All you need to do is to memorize the Constitution. This was particularly important to the Greeks because you cannot take rulership or government during that time as the model of politics, precisely because rulership or the government of other people was taken from the model of the household. The ruler of the household was basically a tyrant. In other words, he commanded the behavior and the conduct of his wife and his children, his slaves, and, and all the other people that constitute the household. So you cannot use that as a model for political life in, in, the, in the police or in the agora. The police precisely was vastly and sharply different from that of the household. No. The, you, you, you do not rule over other people within the political realm. You try to persuade them to agree with your own opinion. Today, we notice that constitutions assign political rights to everyone. But as we all know, the enjoyment of those rights is constrained or blocked by the lack of freedom and social inequality, which during the classical period was precisely a precondition to political participation. Even today, how can you expect Mang Pandoy and people who, who cannot earn enough to keep body and life together, least of all feed their children or educate their children to participate meaningfully in the political realm? They cannot. They cannot, even if the Constitution assigns them their rights, we all know that the promise of politics in our country, in societies like ours, remains fictional. Now, I have referred every now and then to the promise of politics. By the way, my reflections this morning were largely inspired by a book that you might want to read for yourselves by Hannah Arendt. A-R-E-N-D-T, entitled precisely The Promise of Politics. Hannah Arendt, to some of you, may be interesting. She was the girlfriend of Martin Heidegger, one of the greatest living philosophers uh, of the modern century. The object of politics, as I said previously, is to promote the common good. But what constitutes the common good The common good cannot be derived from outside of the realm of politics, like let us say, from religion. Although, of course, in many periods of human history, priests and rabbis 
even philosophers have tried to define the common good outside of the province of politics. No? Even academics like ourselves love to define the common good and seek to impose the common good upon the political realm. No? Even businessmen sometimes want to give us our idea of the common good. No? Lawyers love to invoke the Constitution as the definitive source of the common good. That is not the way the classical tradition defined politics. Politics, it, within the political realm, the idea of the common good was constantly redefined and defined, constantly formulated, reformulated, debated, and endlessly debated. You know? In other words, the idea of the common good has to result from the mutual accommodation of free human beings with one another. That is the reason why politics was sometimes defined as the art of compromise. You cannot enter the political realm with a dogmatic idea of what constitutes the common good and then expect others only to, to believe in you and not to be open to persuasion. To enter the political space is to open yourself to persuasion by others. But this was not the way in which Plato Plato, as, you, as we know, is the source of everything that we know about Socrates, in Viva, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Plato felt so bad about the death of Socrates that he tried to promote this idea of idiocracy. Idiocracy is the rule by ideas. You know? In other words, Plato wanted to control political life by saying that only those who were entitled only those who held and possessed the truth, meaning the philosophers, were entitled to rule. This gave rise to the idea of the philosopher king. In other words, in the distribution of intelligence and talent in the world, only a few had that gift of intelligence, and therefore they alone were entitled to rule. This was Plato's idea, but it was basically in reaction to the death of Socrates. He felt so bad that his master Socrates was condemned to die by the citizens who did not understand what he was doing. No? And in fact, the citizens uh, of the Greek city-state thought that Socrates was merely wasting their time because he was constantly interrogating them and engaging them in dialogue and talking ideas through until the people he was conversing with found themselves in contradiction of themselves. No? But you know, Socrates never shared his own opinion. He was constantly interrogating, he was constantly dialoguing with others so that others hopefully would realize that they were mistaken. But unfortunately, they had a mistaken notion of what Socrates was doing, so they condemned him to die. In reaction to that, the student Plato decided that the Greek city-state was hopeless unless it was ruled by philosophers. And this gave rise to the idea of the philosopher king. Hannah Arendt objects to this whole idea, which sometimes we fall victim to in academe, that just because we are privileged to sit in academe and study ideas, therefore we could impose our ideas believing that they are superior. They are not mere opinions, but they are definitions of the truth, therefore we should rule. You know? I mean, we all know that that is the tyranny of technocracy. When governments are ruled by technocrats who think that they have a monopoly of the truth and of science, that situation is no less of a tyranny. All right? Now, what lessons can we learn from all of this? Number one, a thoughtful citizen takes politics seriously. It is not a passive pastime or merely reading the newspapers, listening to the radio or television, uh, and then sharing our opinions with others in a very idle way. A thoughtful citizen speaks and acts as a free human being. He or she never forgets that he is free. Free to question, free to share, free to persuade, and free to be persuaded. He's not dogmatic. A thoughtful citizen acts on his ideas. He does not merely speak. 
but he initiates new beginnings. He questions, he criticizes, he initiates new beginnings. But what does it take to initiate new beginnings? You cannot simply imagine new beginnings and then say, voila, it will happen out of its own free will. No, you have to organize others in order to initiate and to actualize new beginnings. No? Lastly, a thoughtful citizen, and this is very important, does not confuse the realm of politics with other realms like religion, science, the economy, academe, or even law. I mentioned academe. Let me take as the final um, uh, portion of, of my lecture this morning, this special case of academe, a person like myself, who is a professor, an academic, and people like yourselves who are scholars and buyer. What is a scholar? This scholar is somebody who is freed from life's necessities. It comes from the word scholar, meaning leisure. So you are all gentlemen and ladies of leisure in many ways. Because you are a scholar nambaya. You are here in academe, freed from life's necessities, and therefore you can leisurely pursue ideas. Your life, therefore, the citizen. Except that the citizen participates not in the academy, but in the agora, in the realm of public opinion. You participate the realm of truth, supposedly. The academy, like the university, is subject to its own rules. No? It is not the same rules as the rules of the marketplace of public opinion. The model for us, I believe, is Socrates. The preferred method is not rhetoric or the art of persuasion where the mode of currency, the medium of exchange, is opinion. In the public realm, people exchange opinions with one another. In the academic realm, we don't exchange opinions. We pursue truth. That is how Socrates imagined it. Therefore, the preferred method is not rhetoric or the art of persuasion, but rather the dialectic. The dialectic means the art of dialogue. Socrates did not address the masses, like Pericles, for instance, like Caesar or Julius Caesar. He talked with individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The preferred method, therefore, of Socrates was the dialogue, the dialectic. What is the purpose of the dialogue? The dialogue means talking through in order to expose some contradictions. In order, in the process of dialogue, you refine ideas to yield truth. Truth, therefore, becomes the basis for living one's own life and living with others. But this scholar is also a citizen. And this is where the trouble begins. A professor is also a citizen. And sometimes as a citizen, you're asked to participate in elections, not just as a voter, but believing that you may possess a privileged access to the truth. Therefore, you must be entitled to participate in the ruling of a society. As a citizen, we as professors, you as students, we move also, therefore, in the public realm of ideas, of opinions, rather. By the way, the word, the Greek word for opinion is doxa. No? In the public realm of opinions, we cannot expect our ideas of truth that we learned, let us say, in sociology then, no? or in the natural sciences, to prevail automatically over the opinions of people who do not live in academia. We still need to persuade other people that our own ideas 
we find through the rules and the processes and the methods of academia might be better than ordinary ideas. But we do not expect people to automatically believe so. We still need to persuade others you know, in the realm of public opinion that our ideas are probably worth considering and being treated preferentially. Now, Socrates entered the Agora, however. There was no academy, academy yet at that time. So Socrates propagated his way of thinking in the realm of public opinion, in the marketplace. I understand Socrates was not a very good looking man. You know? As a matter of fact, some descriptions of Socrates made him out to be a short person who had a monstrous face. You we know? were extremely intelligent, but he moved about, if you can imagine the Agora, conversing and talking with other people, and other people just telling him what their opinions are, and then interrogating their opinion. He was constantly asking questions. He was not sharing his own opinion until people realized that their first opinion was completely mistaken. That was the method of the dialectic. He sought, Socrates sought to purify public reason in the hope that purified public reason like gold might be a better guide to the administration of the police. All right. He was mistaken. People did not understand what he was doing as a scholar, as the bearer of the truth. You know? He wanted to show people that their opinions might be subject to many prejudices and biases. And he wanted to show them what it meant to think critically and to think properly and to examine their own opinions. You know? But he was completely misunderstood in his intention. As a matter of fact, they thought that Socrates was subverting the very life of the police. And he was therefore condemned to death. And he could not defend himself. At this defense, he wanted to show the role of a scholar in the purification of reason, but they all thought that this man was just wasting the time of everyone. And therefore, he could not even save his own life. That is the reason why, subsequently, the academy, the university as we know it today, left the public realm, established itself in another place, you know, where it could be free from the prejudices and the biases and the tyranny of others who could not understand or appreciate properly the role of a scholar and in the sanctuaries of a republic like Diliman, we could all pursue in a leisurely way the cause of truth, you know, in the hope that in so purifying reason as citizens, we might be able subsequently to enter the public realm and show others how to think properly and critically. Thank you very much. Um, how could you apply the truth that you have learned from academy to the politics? In, in that, because in your presentation, you said that academy in the modern time has separated from politics. Excellent question. There was a time in the late 1960s and early 70s when we, the possessors of Diliman truths, you know, found out to the countryside you know, in order to conscientize and politicize and teach the masses. You know, go out to the masses and teach them. Well, we all ended up being taught by the masses instead. It was a very humbling experience for many of us. You know, so that the arrogance of academe was properly tempered by the practical lessons that people learn in everyday life. There are at least two ways of doing that. You know? One is learn to listen even as you speak. Therefore, you know, do not think that the truths that have been purified in academia are necessarily superior to the truths that people learn in the course of their everyday lives. We still need 
to persuade other people about the truths of our own opinions. But you see, this is the, the lovely thing about it. Even if here in academe, we might think that if we read it in a book, therefore it must be a truth. If it came from the lips of your professor, it must be the truth. And when you go out of the university and then try out the same ideas with other people, those ideas appear as nothing more than opinions. You still need to persuade others that those opinions are worth considering and perhaps they are probably superior to the opinions of others. So in the first instance, you can perform your role as a university informed thoughtful citizen by learning to listen to others, listen to their opinions, and by sharing and testing the validity of your own ideas against the practical experiences and lessons of other people. One. Two. Two. If you believe, and you have led other people to believe, that your opinions and your ideas and your truths are not only worth considering, but in fact, they are valid representations of the reality in which we live, then the next duty of a thoughtful citizen is to act on these ideas by initiating new beginnings and by learning to organize others. Because if you persuaded others that your truth is important and worth considering, what do you do with the fruits of your persuasion? You organize so that you could transform the social reality in which we live. So first by listening, second by speaking and persuading, Third, by acting through organizing. Next question. Uh, based on the idea that as we know, so politics is the convocation of the citizen, the invocation of the citizen, we highly, we highly encourage people to be highly interested in politics, especially during elections. Uh, am I encouraging you to, to participate in politics, especially during elections? Most definitely. But first, I think we should not equate politics with elections. To my mind, if you ask me, elections are very important components of the political process, but they are not everything about politics. I hardly mentioned elections here, didn't I? And that was very deliberate, because I wanted to distinguish politics as the vocation of free human beings from rulership or government. Elections has to do with choosing people to represent us and to perform the functions of government, to govern, therefore. But as I said, the problem is that uh, many people participate in a political process like elections without being free. And therefore, because they are imprisoned by their own material necessities, they tend to trade their votes for money. In other words, hungry people cannot be expected to choose freely whom to vote for. That is why it has always been very, very difficult for people like us in academia to enter the public realm and think that just because we have been able to persuade people what it means to vote wisely, that necessarily when they go to the polling precincts, that they will follow um, the ideas we have shared with them. When Bush comes to show, they will exchange their votes for money precisely because a hungry person is not free. If he is not free, therefore he cannot be properly political. Next question. It's great that you showed us the original meaning of politics and that you contrasted it with the, our, our definition of politics today. But I was just wondering what happened in the course of history that gave us the, that new idea of politics and is it still possible for us to go back to that original definition? Excellent question. It's actually the question that, that the whole book by Hannah Arendt tried to answer. Uh, but what she called the political tradition of the Athenian state. 
which invented the whole concept of politics, unfortunately has been forgotten um, through the many stages of, of human history. You know? uh, so that today, uh, we tend to equate politics nearly with, with government. And sometimes you might even stumble upon societies that think of themselves as political and yet they're run by tyrants. You know? I mean, tyranny is everything that politics is not. It is the exact opposite. You know? I mean, politics precisely assumes the existence of, of free human beings. You know? Now, the question is, is it still possible for us to somehow recapture the basic classical essence of politics as it was first invented in, in the Greek city-state? Now, it's very interesting, actually, that the writing up of the political tradition was done in retrospect. In other words, you know, the reflection uh, about politics in the way it was originally exercised happened during that time when the Athenian city-state was already collapsing. It was already decaying. You know? So it was all in retrospect. You know? Now, there are many theories as to how this happened, that, that the decay of politics uh, over the years uh, happened uh, in, in, in many societies. You know? One reason might be that, uh, and, and this is Hannah Arendt's argument, uh, during the Roman period, with the rise of the Republic, and you had more people, because the city-state was a very small city-state, there were very few people, and therefore you would say that this was an example of a direct democracy. You know? People could formulate agreements and call them laws, you know? but in the next instance they are revising those laws. That's possible in the course of their own dialogues and, and persuasion. But when you have large societies, and the idea of the republic comes in, you know, then those laws become not just common agreements that are useful for a particular time, but they also tend to be sanctified, especially by religion. You know? In other words, these laws are worth obeying and letting them command our lives, not just because they are common agreements, but in fact they are ordained by God. You know? So that therefore you have a fusion between religion and the state. So that there was a long period in the history of human societies when the principal purpose of the state, which should have been the realm of politics, was the promotion of religious faith. No. In the modern period, religion became divorced from politics, or politics emancipated itself from religion. In the modern period, therefore, the only answer to the complexity of societies is the differentiation of different realms. In other words, you do not confuse political communication with religious communication, with economic communication, or you do not confuse the realm of the household with the realm of the state. The moment you do that, you go wrong and you distort the very promise of politics. Is it still possible, therefore, to go back and to recapture the lost essence of the classical notion of politics? Maybe it may be very difficult to restore the Athenian city-state, you know? uh, but we can borrow some of the lessons of the classical notion of politics as it was first invented by the Greeks in order to enrich and enhance our own political lives. It is possible to do that. You know? That is why I have always argued, if we want to actualize the promise of politics in our country, we must do everything to end the scourge of mass poverty, which prevents a large number of our people from participating meaningfully in the political life of our nation. Next question. Sir, since you, men yeah. Sir, since you mentioned that I know, both day, a hundred percent is not really free or politically free if he's hungry. But um, so, um, but both is as an essential component of democracy. 
So it was actually debated in our class in Democracy Build in the Philippines, and it, somehow the government won. So Democracy Build in the Philippines. So if if Democracy Build in the Philippines, we, our class have, um, had been wondering if what what do you think is the perfect form of government that looks with the needs of our country, of our current POTUS? That's a very good question. No? It's worthy of, of being debated. No? I mean, what's the perfect type of government for our country? You know, I, I am in complete agreement with people who argue that that may be an authoritarian form of government may be useful to a society at a given point in time in order to solve its economic problems. But that's not politics. That is, then you're not talking about politics. You might be talking of tyranny in the service of economic development. So at a certain point, you may have to decide as a people whether your first priority is economic development or economic growth, in which case you're willing to sacrifice your political status as citizens the way we did in 1972, you know, when Marcos said, trust me, give me all your rights at this point and I'll deliver economic development to you when everybody is already prosperous and in a position to exercise their political rights and obligations in a meaningful way, then we can have a country governed by a democratic constitution. 1972 to 1986, we gave Marcos that trust. Unfortunately, what happened is that when we allow tyranny to prevail, the tyrant forgets that he has made promises. And we have lost our rights to such an extent that we can no longer determine for ourselves what we want. What we want. So if you ask me, between economic development and political freedom, I choose political freedom. I choose political freedom. We have gone through the rigors of tyranny that was established in the name of economic growth no? And we have failed. But people come up to me and say, you know, Thomas More's utopia has been realized in Singapore. A perfectly administered society where there is no political freedom as we know it. No. But everyone has enough to eat. My reply to that has always been, Everyone has enough to eat. Is that our idea of a good society? But even animals in zoos have enough to eat. That cannot be our idea of a good society. A good society is a society that is committed to freedom and the exercise of our faculties as human beings. Next question. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I have two questions. Go ahead. Uh, first about journalism. Second is about uh, something controversial. First okay. question is, we have already uh, shown the relationship and the different uh, differentiation between the academic uh, politics or between the far and the citizen. Uh, what about the uh, relationship between journalists or being writers and citizens per se? Uh, knowing that journalists have their own rules to follow in their profession. And the uh, <clears throat> second question is, uh, uh, could you please comment on the recent controversy that, that uh, Inquirer uh, got it into when they allegedly uh, caricatured the <laughs> photo of the Metro uh, The allegation that Inquirer is pro Noi Noi. Okay, thank you. Very good. Uh, the first question uh, is, what is the relationship of journalists to politics? Is, is that right? Yeah. I, I think that the journalism or the activity of people within the mass media you know, has its own rules. Uh, those rules prevent journalists from sharing their political opinions in the course of their work. 
because the proper work of a journalist is to report information rather than to report his own opinion. Okay? But then the question you will ask is, what about people like yourself? I think I am not properly a journalist. I am an opinion writer. Columnists, therefore, are not journalists in the proper sense of the word. They are opinion makers. They're given space in the newspapers to share their opinions. But those opinions are not necessarily entitled to privileged treatment just because they appear there. That is the reason why they can be questioned, they can be interrogated, they can be criticized, especially today in endless blogs, Twitters, and uh, tweets, and, uh, and Facebook. Uh, you can be caricatured for what you write, you know? uh, thanks to the internet. The, the pronouncements of columnists like myself uh, are no longer represented as the gospel truth. In fact, they can be the reason for you to be condemned, caricatured, criticized, and, and ridiculed. You know? In other words, the internet has made possible the restoration of the classical notion of the agora. Because everybody now can be a columnist. You know? I mean, to open a blog, you, you, can, you, can, you can tweet anytime. No? In real time, as a matter of fact. No? So, there is a nice book about journalism in the context of the general mass media, looking at, at the rules governing modern mass media. This is by Nicholas Luhmann entitled The Function of the Mass Media. No? But the second question is, can I comment on the recent faux pas of the Philippine Daily Inquirer, which is my newspaper, uh, putting on, 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 on the front page uh, a series of photographs that appear to ridicule uh, uh, Mr. Demetrio Vicente. Huh? I think the inquirer has properly apologized for that. No? Uh, the inquirer received a lot of criticisms, uh, not because the, 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 the photographs demonstrated uh, a seeming bias against a witness for the Chief Justice, but because uh, those photographs depicted uh, uh, a person who had been a victim of a stroke you know, in a way uh, that, that might make him an object of ridicule. That is not the purpose of a newspaper. You know? and, and, and I'm very glad that the editors have apologized for that, even if that may not have been the intention uh, uh, for putting those photographs on its front page. Next question. Yes. Um, sir, with the inconsistencies of democracy or the democratic processes in the country, um, due to the politicizing of the rights and obligations of people as a citizen, um, do you think that democracy in this country because of these political principles have failed the nation or the citizens themselves failed those processes and those principles that created the gaps between the elites and the lower classes and to so what to extent do you think has it failed or not failed the country i think that our leaders have failed our country you cannot blame the victims <laughs> Our people, the people whom we have elected to public office, who have been entrusted with governing the police, have failed our people. Uh, they should have used the political power that was entrusted to them in order to enhance the potential for free politics in our country by solving the basic problem of mass poverty. Instead, they have used political power and governmental power to enrich themselves by failing to make a distinction between the requirements of their households and the requirements of the state to which we all belong. That is the reason why one of the basic defects of political life in our country is the use of political power for private aggrandizement. aggrandizement the private enriching of people rather than the enriching of the entire society and the entire nation. And we see this uh, lastly, and I think this is very, very important to us, 
a nation, a national leadership that is truly committed to ending mass poverty in our country must increase the budget for public education and public health you know, and public housing. Because without these basic necessities being secured, it is almost entirely futile to expect the citizens of a country like ours, notwithstanding the promises of the Constitution, to exercise their political rights in a substantive and meaningful way. Yeah, go ahead. So when you say like leaders are the ones that are failing us, so why wouldn't why we as agents, why we us the one affected them to think that I don't think that they're failing? Like, cause them to be someone that fails the society instead of them being Absolutely correct. What do we do with leaders who fail us? We throw them out. <laughs> we should throw them out. You know? But how is it that we keep electing them and returning them back and adding more like them you know, to public office? As Yul Brynner would say, it's a puzzlement. And I think by understanding the original meaning of politics, we might be able to make a difference by precisely carrying a perspective like that to the lowest of our communities and reaching the lowest and the most underprivileged among our people and to tell them to shun having to sell their votes and to exercise their last remaining political rights as citizens in order to cleanse our government of people who misuse political power. But why is it something like that that's so commonsensical cannot seem to spell a difference in our political life? I mean, look at the composition of Congress who are supposed to represent us. Look at the composition of the Senate. Some people simply do not open their mouths. As I told you, the first privilege of the citizen is to speak. Unfortunately, speaking also carries with it the obligation to speak intelligently. <laughs> so it could also be a curse. You cannot exercise a right if you don't know how to exercise it. Hindi ba? Kaya ang daming miyembro ng Komite de Silencio in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Unfortunately, they have exposed themselves during this impeachment trial. Hindi ba? Now we know. That is why I like listening to the impeachment trial. Because it tells us of the urgency of throwing out some people from our political life. Next question. Sir, you have mentioned earlier the philosopher Nietzsche. Um, what is your definition or classification or uh, characteristics for your standards of being a philosopher king? And do you think our president today possesses that ability? Uh, <laughs> you're provoking, huh? <laughs> Good question. No, I don't think our president is a philosopher king. But I did not mean that as a negative comment. No. Precisely because even if Plato believed that the good society should be ruled by philosopher king, by a philosopher king, no. um, Hannah Arendt, whom I use for these notes, for these lecture notes, believed that the rule of a philosopher king will end up in tyranny. It will violate the very notion of politics. And yet the idea of a philosopher king is very appealing to us in academia. I mean, when we talk like this, and we say how stupid those politicians are, <laughs> we are in effect saying, why don't we replace them with ourselves? Well, that is the path to tyranny, unfortunately. We cannot claim to replace them unless we go through the same process of persuading people to believe in us. We cannot simply assume 
that just because we are inhabitants of the privileged republic of Biliman, therefore we possess the truth, therefore by simple possession of the truth, we are entitled to rule our society. That cannot be. That would be an idiocracy, not a democracy. We must still go through the process of persuading other people that the opinions we have formed and purified in Akadin might at least be worth considering. Yes. Uh, sir, given the current situation of the university where we can see different forms of activism, uh, can you say that we as scholars are entering the public realm in the right way? We might be preparing ourselves for participation in the public realm in the right way. This is as it should be. Meaning that if you are arguing with your professor or with your fellow students, it is not enough to quote somebody. By simply quoting, let us say, Marx, Mao, or Lenin, you presume your ideas to have the authority of that quotation? No. You still need to persuade others that that idea makes sense, is relevant to our situation, and is worth considering. Now, if we tangle with one another in such a dialectical way, Socrates hoped that through question and answer, through dialogue, through thinking through difficult ideas, we might be able to arrive at our notion of the truth. And if we bring these truths back to the public realm, it might, those truths might hopefully enrich political life, but there is no guarantee. There is no guarantee. But the whole idea of being in the university is not just to learn ideas, it's not just to study, it's not just to reflect on ideas, no. it's not just to use our leisure time in order to improve the way we think. No but it is also to improve the way we communicate with other people in preparation for the more difficult task of communicating with the larger society. That is why life in the university is all about learning, talking, persuading others you know, to consider the truths that we claim for ourselves. It's a good training, I must say, for eventually communicating with the rest of our people in the public realm. But you must carefully note, the rules of academia are very different from the rules of political life. In the political life, you address a throng. You address the masses. You address the public. In academia, mostly, we address ourselves on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You know? And therefore, you can be, afford to be more critical you can afford to be less demagogic. In public life, public life, that's, that is a stage for demagogues. They, because it is the art of persuasion that matters more than the pursuit of the truth. But it does not make politics inferior for being that. No. It's just the way politics is. No. It still has its own virtues despite the fact that it thrives mostly through, through persuasion rather than through careful dialogue in the pursuit of the truth. In other words, politics has its own truth. Just as science and, and, and scholarly pursuit would have its own truth. We must learn to make that distinction. Always. Next question. Well, we learned in class that we live in a culture that we're kind of driven by self-interest, right? Like, many of us pick courses not because it's going to be for the common good, but because it's for our good. So, given that, like, given that fact, who can even be considered free people? Like, who are, who can actually participate in politics when we all have self-interest in mind? Great question. Wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. That is the reason why the household cannot be a space for free people. We all know that, you're not free within the family. You're free only the moment you leave the household. Because there you cannot say, this is what my family needs and therefore it is what should happen. 
The moment you say that, somebody else is going to say, but that's your family. This is what my family needs. And another one would say, those are your families, but this is what my family needs. In other words, we all bring our self-interest in the public realm, but operating in the public realm would compel us to adjust our self-interest, to keep in step, and to be in accord with the common good of everybody. We may begin with our self-interest when we enter politics, but the political process itself, so long as it works properly, will compel you to adjust and to compromise your self-interest and think of the common good instead. What did the common good entail during that time, during the period, classical period of the Athenian state? It meant how do we guarantee that there is abundant food for everybody? How do we protect the police from invaders? Number two, no? how do we reconcile its household's needs with the other needs of the households? Where, you, where do you delineate properties, property lines? In other words, when you bring your personal self-interest into the political realm, you are also conscious that just because it is your personal self-interest that it will necessarily prevail, that self-interest has to be adjusted to the self-interest of the others. Therefore, the promise of the political life precisely is that it will transcend the private interests of particular persons. That is how it should be. The pro that is how it should be, and that is how it is, where people are equal to one another in the political realm. But if in the political realm, some people are more equal than others, then the private household interests of those more dominant others will tend to prevail. But that would be a corruption of politics as a concept. That is why the classical political life presumed that this was the activity not only of free men, but of equal men. Without freedom and equality, what you have is a distorted concept of politics. Is that convincing? Right. Next question. Yeah. One last question. Sir, sir, I would really like to you know, relate this topic with the current situation here or not. So, like, uh, do you think that the current government is finally doing the right thing in addressing the cyclical retardation of our nation's growth by attacking corruption and cleansing the departments? I think it's a good beginning. It's a worthy beginning to attack the foundation of corruption. Um, but I think more basic than attacking the foundation of corruption is attacking the foundation of mass poverty and inequality in our society. Uh, right now, the only meaningful program for attacking poverty, to my mind, is the conditional cash transfer program or the four piece, Pantawid Pampamilyam Filipino uh, program, which gives uh, deserving qualified families uh, anywhere from 500 pesos to 1,400 pesos a month uh, in order to, to end the intergenerational transfer of poverty. To me, 1,400 might be a substantial amount of money for some people, but it is not enough. In itself, it will not end the scourge of poverty. What will end the scourge of poverty is the creation of jobs and livelihood opportunities, uh, the democratization of access to economic life so that people need no longer have to go abroad in order to earn a living. Uh, that is what I personally am waiting to see. 
from this government. You know. um, I am still willing to listen and believe that that will come after the problem of corruption has been solved. To me, those two problems can be attacked simultaneously. You need not wait until you establish the foundations for good government in order to, to start attacking the problem of poverty. You know? But of course, it's very difficult to attack the problem of poverty without solving the problem of corruption at different levels of government, precisely because public funds are being pocketed at different levels. You know? So Tama, Tama yung strategy nyo, no? But now, okay, uh, you have to enhance livelihood. You have to create jobs. You, know? you have to put some money into education and improve the skills and knowledge of our own people so that they can function meaningfully and properly in a world that has become more complex and highly competitive. Um, I have yet to see that. Now, the government claims that there are not enough funds right now to attack that. Uh, I think that there are enough funds. And we would like to see them being invested in education, in public health, and in public housing, at the very least. Might as well be the last. I've been trying in three months. <laughs> I'm impressed, uh, Professor Green, by the quality of the questions. My hair is been standing on ends because of the brilliance, yeah. the thoughtfulness, the depth, and the conscientiousness of the questions. I must congratulate your young faculty for preparing them. I agree. Because if you were not prepared, the quality of the questions would not have been as critical as new ones as I heard them. So congratulations. That was a, that was the first. Second, politics, as one sage said, is the accumulation, distribution, and maintenance of power. And therefore, it would seem to me that politics is much too important left to politicians. And that would mean, therefore, that politics means engagements. Engagement. The reason I'm here, Professor David, is I looked at the title of this entire forum and it said, Intelligent Citizenship. The first time I've encountered that phrase, there is obedient citizenship, there is uh, 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 constitutional citizenship, or rather law-abiding citizenship, but intelligent citizenship, it's the first. And the, the, the final title, thoughtful citizenship, is even better. And therefore, it puts us in a position to claim politics for ourselves instead of giving uh, instead of endorsing all of our political life to politicians. The quality of the early questions were in that vein, elections, politics as elections. But really, the responsibility of the season, it seemed to me, is what it does after elections in intervening to make sense of political life. That's, that's my opinion. The, the other part that was implied here, Professor David, that wasn't discussed very well, is not so much the uh, uh, dialectical part or the uh, dialogic part or the debating part, but the organizing and acting part. Other than participating in rallies and the usual affairs that we do here to empower ourselves and intervene, perhaps we can maybe give our students what else they can do to become, even now, as scholars, active participants in the political process so that they can claim politics as part of themselves and part of citizenship and part of nation. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Professor Abraham's comments provide me with a perfect occasion to take one or two minutes for concluding points uh, for this lecture. The word politician today is something that we despise generally, isn't it? When you say what does your father do? He's a politician. You don't feel well. <laughs> I mean, it is not a complimentary paper. But in the first instance, in the classical world of the Greeks, to be a politician meant fundamentally to be a citizen, being a free person, who is entitled to share his own opinions, to persuade others, 
to this opinion. So, before politicians as we know them today stole the concept of politics, the proper concept was citizenship. And as Andrew said, what we've been saying throughout this lecture is for all of us to claim politics by being thoughtful citizens. Politics is ours. It's not just government that is ours. It is basically politics that is ours. If we think of ourselves as free persons who are entitled to our own opinions. Second point, which is very, very important that Ed uh, mentioned, is the whole concept of organizing, which admittedly, we did not have time to tackle. That would probably be the subject of another lecture, and hopefully in the discussion of that section of citizenship, we might consider including a section on, on, on practical politics, how to organize. And that's very, a very important point, mainly because in most instances, a politicized person is thought of as a person who can speak properly, persuade others, but not something that, who can advocate, advocacies, you know, who can champion causes, but not necessarily as somebody who can organize others in order to move or shake things and change society. You know. It's not just somebody, as Marx said, uh, people who've interpreted the world in various ways, when the point, however, is to change it. You, know? um, you don't change the world by simply advocating. You change the world by initiating new beginnings. You initiate new beginnings by organizing. Question is, how do we initiate new beginnings and how do we organize? It is something that is not explicitly taught in the university. Most of us might think that organizing means simply joining organizations and therefore joining rallies, demonstrations, etc., etc. You know, making banners, putting them up, uh, the kit, the kit uh, on the walls, noy uh, noying, whatever that means, no? and so on and so forth, or planking. No, no. Uh, to me, those are the minor accompaniments of political action. Real political action is organizing. What do you organize? No. Well, first of all, when you persuade your classmates about the correctness of your position on, let us say, given issues, the no. question you should always ask yourself, what do we do next? No. And let's spread the word and organize more of ourselves. No. Not just to participate in demonstrations, although I have to tell you that is crucial to the experience of every UP student. You do not graduate from UP if you have not had any experience no, in participating in a demonstration, running and then re-entering the public realm, exiting, re-entering, and so on and so forth, and playing patintero with the police. No? <laughs> it's organizing. But what we often forget is that the best place to organize is our communities, where we live, our neighborhoods. You know? To organize them even for something like proper disposal of trash. You know? That is part of the activity of political life, to organize them in such a manner that stray dogs are not allowed because they're entitled to be taken care of properly, their pets, that is part of political life. You know? To organize neighborhoods so that kids who are out in the streets should be entitled to proper education, that is part of political organizing. You know? But to organize a neighborhood so that we can, let us say, carry out the electoral process for a barangay elections in a proper way, and the issues are properly ventilated, and the candidates are properly introduced to everybody, that is organizing, you know? But the ultimate organizing in modern societies is the organizing of a political party. That is where you make a real difference in modern political life. It's very difficult 
To say that you have shaped or changed the contours of political life in any society if you are merely standing up for elections or you are merely voting. The ultimate test of political organizing is the organization of a different political party. A political party that matters. A political party that shapes and shakes up an entire society. That is the ultimate test of organizing. Maybe we should have a course in the organic organizing of political parties you know, <laughs> uh, as a sequel to citizenship. But with that, I thank you very much for your attention and for your